Sit around and do some activating. Don't want to vacuum today, but I have to vacuum today. There's not much in the next one. Oh, my God. 
So Barbara Bain had to replace in the briefing section. This was the first episode in which the tape recording on this machine self-destructed, although at this point they call it decompose. This tape recording will decompose immediately. Good luck. So in season two, Peter Graves replaced Stephen Hill, and this is the first time his character interacts with the Craig 212. It's in episode seven of that season when he plays the message inside a photo booth. This time we have the more traditional self-destruct. This recording will self-destruct in five seconds. But with the tape going up in smoke, out of sight. Let's move on and take a look at the machine in question. Now, the one that I found on eBay was in excellent condition, but it was missing any of its accessories, including the tape reels. No problem, I thought. I've got a box of three inch reels that will fit this perfectly. Now, these reels have 150 foot of tape on them. They could hold more on one of these reels, as you can see, but the tapes were really designed for recording messages on that you would send to relatives abroad. This is from the days when international calls would either be insanely expensive or, in some cases, just completely impractical. But putting these reels on the machine, and it immediately becomes obvious that they are the right size. I mean, they'll work fine, but there's quite a bit of room to spare. In the clips from the show, the head tape reel seems to almost fill the sunken well around the spindles. But when I look at mine, I've got quite a bit more room to spare. And it turns out that this machine, like many of the 1960s portables, used three and a quarter inch reels. The reason for this is that most of these machines are rebadged models from Japan. And of course, Japan uses metric measurements, so rather than having three inch reels, they used eight centimetre ones, which are closer in size to three and a quarter inches. So then I went on the hunt to find myself some eight centimetre or three and a quarter inch reels and found a chap in Italy who was selling a pair of new old stock. Now in comparison to those three inch reels, these ones are maxed out with tape. In fact, they contain 120 metres or 400 foot of tape rather than the 150 foot of these smaller diameter ones. Now I needed to use one of these as a take-up spool, so of course that involved taking the tape off it, winding it onto a spare spool. In this case I'm putting it onto a five inch reel. And now I can finally put this thing together. It's a very simple machine to spool, but you can understand why the cassette eventually took over, as once one of these tapes reaches the end, you need to swap the reels across and do this all over again. Looking at the right machine, you can see it's got a mono speaker on the top, as well as an output for an external one. There's a mono mini jack socket for a microphone and a socket for a baby remote control. And you can also see the instructions that the external microphone that was originally supplied with the machine has a two in one plug on the end of the wire to plug both those sockets as well as a switch on the microphone which can activate the recording from the microphone itself. In the standard practice for portable tape recorders at this point, our external mic has an internal one would have no doubt been drowned out by the noise of the machine itself. Now I don't have the original microphone, I'll just plug my own in so I can record something on this though. The controls on the machine do look a little bit odd nowadays, but it did ensure at the time that you couldn't accidentally activate two functions at the same time, which is something that you could potentially do if you had a piano key layout for these controls. Below these, we've got volume control and to the left, the record button that proudly states it's got automatic level recording. This feature is also mentioned again on the head cover. Anyway, let's have a go at recording something. Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it, is to test whether or not this tape recorder is working. Now at this point I discovered that Rewind wasn't working. I've tested it before, I put the reels on and it was working then, but it seems like the machine just doesn't have the necessary torque to turn the reels with the tape spools on there. So I'll take a look at that later at the moment, I'll just resort to manual rewinding. Now, given the age of this thing, that really doesn't sound bad at all, and indeed, despite its simple appearance, this really was one of the better budget portables of this era, and a lot of that is down to this. 
Yes, just like a standard cassette recorder, it uses a pitch roller and a capster. Now, many of the small consumer tape recorders, the reel-to-reel -reel ones from the 1960s, use a much simpler ribbon drive mechanism. In fact, Rishi, I featured in episode one of this season, used this crude technique, and it did have the benefit of making a simpler mechanism, so as a result, the machines themselves were easier and cheaper to make, but it also had the significant disadvantage of not keeping the tape speed constant. To demonstrate this, I've put some blue tape on these spools. Now, when I start the tape recorder, you can see that the right-hand reel is rotating much quicker than the left-hand one. However, as we move through the tape, this gets reversed. So, by the end of the tape, it's the left-hand reel which is moving far quicker than the right-hand one. Now, a capstan, which is the spinning silver roller here, rotates at the same speed, no matter how much tape has been played. The rubber pitch roller below it pushes up against this, and it's these things that drag the tape through, that advance the tape. On a machine with a capstan drive, the tape reels are really just responsible for letting out and taking up slack. The tape itself is always being pulled at the same speed by the capstan. Now, a ring drive machine rotates the spools at a constant pace, which means as the tape is wearing from one reel to the other, the speed that the tape moves up varies. Therefore, it's not really suitable for recording music, especially if you want to play it back on a full-size machine that would definitely be using a standard capstan drive mechanism. Now, the specifications for this particular machine state it can record or play at two different speeds, one in seven eighths inches per second, which is the same as a standard compact cassette tape, and three and three quarter inches per second. To adjust the speed to the slower one, you have to unscrew the capstan cover, which reveals a thinner capstan inside, and the metal peg at the top of the machine is there for you to screw this removed component onto for safekeeping. And now, if the thinner capstan pulling the tape through. When I press play, you can see that the tape moves at half its original speed. Now, as the reduced speed results in less fidelity, it also means you can record for longer onto one tape. The tape was quite expensive. According to the specifications, if you use both halves of a standard 300-foot long tape, you can record for 64 minutes at the slower speed. Of course, you'd have to break that in the middle to swap the tape around and record onto the other side. The 400 foot 8 centimetre reels I've got would last a little bit longer than that, but you can see from this chart on the back of the 3 inch tape box that one of those 150 foot tapes at the high speed would only record a total of 16 minutes of mono audio. Now, I'd just like to go off on a bit of a tangent here because there's something etched onto the lid of this machine that might make you think differently about a commonly used word or phrase. As you can see, it's got a footage indicator with a scale. Now, this is to help you judge how much tape you've used or have remained. Of course, a scale like this is something commonly seen on cassette decks or on the cassettes themselves. But the interesting thing is the use of the word footage because nowadays that's a term that's commonly associated with a visual medium. Found footage, lost footage, unseen footage, dramatic footage, dashcam footage. So I think if I responded to this advert and send them in an audio recording, they'd be rather surprised. But of course, when you think about it, footage refers to a measurement of the amount of something in feet. So this reel has less footage than this one. So footage could relate to a film reel or an audio tape, it's just referring to the length of the media. So in the era of digital recording, the idea of actually having footage, physical footage of anything, is usually an inaccurate anachronism. Well, that probably comes from that life-changing revelation. Let's have a look inside the machine. I'll see if I can figure out why it's struggling with rewinding. That's a one-day construction, and the next day I imagine this was a very reliable machine. The main belt looks fine. It's also interesting to see how these transport controls activate the leaf switches inside. But to give it a proper test, I'll need to put my batteries back in. But unfortunately, they won't stay in place with the cover removed. Now, there is a DC power jack that I can use on the side. In fact, in one episode, it looks like Somebody must have forgotten to bring the batteries so and they've used it there. However, I decided to instead just quickly take my batteries together while I test it out. And I can see that while it's running, there is another bell down below. Perhaps 
There's more than one valve in there, and to get to that part would require some serious disassembly. Although, if you were serious in repairing one of these, it's hard to see they've got a circuit diagram inside the lid. That was something common at the time. But since I didn't want to risk breaking what was partially working, because I hadn't shot the intro at this point, I decided that my wisest course of action was just to leave it as a functioning prop and put the lid back on. Now let's get back to having a look how the machine was used in a TV show. Now if you've seen part one of this series, you'll know that the intro sequences were often recycled by reusing the overall setup, but replacing the voiceover which was supposed to be coming from the tape, as well as the close-up of the hands showing the photos of the target of that particular mission. But this particular tape recorder has the honour of being in a sequence that was used three times across the series. It starts with Jim pulling up to a car park where almost every other car is a Volkswagen Beetle. He then walks up and unlocks the car park attendant's cabin and retrieves the tape recorder and the whole of the photos off the shelf. Now, some of the close-up footage here is reused. Notice how the background surface of the machine changes to this metal perforated tray. That's a shot that's been taken from Season 2, Episode 7, the interior of that photo booth. However, you might also have noticed something a little bit unusual about the right-hand reel on the sheet. There's some kind of damaged metal bowl resting in the centre of it that isn't on the left-hand reel. And that takes back to this scene from Season 1, the first time the tape self-destructed. You can see the metal section is present on the reel here as well, but it's looking all new and shiny at this point. And if you look at it closely, you can also make out some wires underneath. And that's because it's a pyrotechnic device used to create the self-destruct effect. But if we wind that back, we can see that the effect seems to have been slightly larger than anticipated and was briefly set fire to the prop. So the next time the crank 212 gets used again, they opt to do the self-destruct effect off-camera. But if you look closely, you can see that the style of grating in this scene is different, and the machine that goes up in smoke behind it is different. And that's because, again, it's footage that's taken from another episode. And that machine behind the grating is the one that I'll feature in part three if I get around to making it. Now, the next time Jim uses this machine in the car park cabin, the tape is taken off of it and disposed of in an ashtray with a pretty underwhelming pyrotechnic effect. So, like through that season when they reuse the car park scene, a quick edit is done to the disposal sequence to make it look more instantaneous. There are a couple more appearances of the 212 in Season 3 where the tapes are destroyed by taking them off the machine and disposing of them by some external means. There were also a couple of versions of the smoke event in the trial. This one with the lid on looks particularly effective, but they only did this once in the entire series. However, by the third time the car park scene was used towards the end of Season 3, they'd also started putting the Craig logo on the tape props there, which did lead to a couple of continuity errors where they cut back and forth between the older footage and the newly shot stuff. But this time around, the scene did use the standard self-destructing smoke effect. Now you can see the smoke comes from inside the machine and exits by these holes that they've drilled behind the reel. But that doesn't have given the desired effect. Too much smoke still coming from elsewhere on the machine, so they've ended up drilling more holes at the bottom of the tape spool as well. And still they mustn't have been happy with that because they've then gone back and drilled additional holes through the tape reel as well. Now just like the earlier crank machine I showed in the previous episode, the 212 also had a machine that was used for playing the tapes with the voiceover of course added later in post and then a separate machine which was responsible for the smoke effect when the tape was self-destructed. The smoke prop can be identified as far back as season two by the dent on its speaker and its missing capstan sleeve rest. That's the name given to the little metal peg at the top of the machine which is used to hold the capstan. You can see in this side-by-side -side shot that the smoke prop is the one on the right. Now, someone must have been a little bit concerned about the continuity issue between the appearance of the two machines, as in this episode from Season 4, they jammed a small peg 
into the hole where the missing capstan sleeve rest would have gone to make it look similar to the ocean player. However, by season seven, we can see they do have a prop that's capable of both spinning the wheels and producing the smoke with no cutaway required. Now, you may remember my acting masterclass with the stilted conversation from the beginning of this video, after all, how could you forget? But that was based on a kind of intro that they used throughout the series, but more perhaps towards the end. Let's have a look at this. Beautiful, beautiful, funny. What lens do you use? 85 millimeter. Number of workers, I like a 135 or a 150 or so. And the lens case on the table. Beautiful. Beautiful. Keep it up. Right. Beautiful. Now, unlike the first take of that I featured, this one doesn't really appear to have given anyone any issues. There are no goops I can spot throughout the usage of this in the series. The closest I've got is this. The first time round they use this sequence, the tape book comes out of the drawer with a lid on, they remove the lid and play the tape. The second time they use the sequence, they don't show the lid being removed, so therefore it just magically vanishes. Good morning, Mr. Bumps. But overall, it appears that once they've ironed out those initial issues with getting the machine to look like the tape was self-destructing, it became a dependable workhorse for the show. If you're making a TV show, you need props that just work and are easy for the talent to operate. The Craig 212, despite not really appearing as we might now picture the spy recorder to look, did earn its role on the series just by doing its job consistently. So that's the story of the Craig 212 and Mission Impossible. If you're interested in seeing a part 3 to this series, then please let me know. However, bear in mind these videos take a heck of a lot of editing to put together, so it's going to be a couple of months in the future before it appears if it does, so you might want to think about subscribing to the channel to avoid missing it. But that is it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.
It is now 10 o'clock, so we're going to cut this off, guys.